14 years ago, I became a Cisco Certified System Instructor, a certification most people don't know exists out there, which is essentially when Cisco blesses you to go teach Cisco authorized curriculum. Well, to get that certification, you actually have to fly in a plane out to Cisco, and they actually have you teach uh, material to them from the CCNA course uh, at essentially some material that you pick, and then they pick some material at random that you have to just jump up and teach right there. Well, when I, when I flew out there uh, to Cisco, I chose the OSI model as my topic to talk about. Now, this is 14 years ago. I'm still new in the whole Cisco uh, world and I had prepared almost everything uh, when going out to uh, Cisco to, uh, to teach. Uh, so I taught the OSI model, and it went awesome. Cisco was like, that was amazing, great, well done. Uh, now we want you to teach us spanning tree protocol. <laughs> and I said, no! It was like the, the one topic I had not prepared completely for. I had five minutes to prep before I had to get up in front of Cisco and do a 15-minute lesson on spanning tree. And oh my word, how I scraped by that presentation, I don't know. Because Spanning Tree, why, why was it the one I avoided? It's always the, like, okay, it just kind of, you're right, it just kind of does its thing. It's on by default, it stops loops, that's what you need to know, right? That's, that's good. Well, I will tell you, in my career, I have had more network devastating issues related to Spanning Tree. So in the past 14 years, I've learned Spanning Tree really well. Uh, so let me, uh, first off, say this nugget is all about revisiting Spanning Tree because we uh, originally talked about this in the SPNGN1 series as kind of the foundation. So I'm going to revisit some of those concepts and then introduce some new ones as in what are the different flavors of spanning tree what do we use in the service provider network often so here are your do I know this already questions so go ahead and pause look at these if you feel like you got it go ahead and jump to the next nugget otherwise let's continue well let me start off with a kind of twisted question uh, here, here here it comes is redundancy good Yes, I would say almost always redundancy is good, except in the case of a non-spanning tree network, because redundancy will destroy it all. Uh, matter of fact, just today, I'm, I'm serious. I know, I know it sounds like I just come up with these stories out of the blue. Just today, one of my customers that I support had a complete spanning tree meltdown. R remind me uh, when, when I finish describing the initial view, how it happened in their environment. I'll just put a... a uh, phone here because it involved a phone okay so redundancy if first off is this is this a redundant network uh, no not at all because uh, this guy might be communicating to this guy and if one switch fails let's just say that guy in the middle we lose full connectivity how do we solve that redundant connection just like that but if you have no STP what happens is everything goes down because as soon as this computer sends a broadcast, or any computer, as a matter of fact, sends a broadcast, whoa, I have no idea what happened there. Uh, sends, so as soon as broadcast comes in, the switch receives it and sends it out all ports, because that's what it's supposed to do with a broadcast. This switch receives it and sends it out all ports, and the switch receives it and sends it out all ports, and somewhere right around there we have broadcast coming in and going out, uh, these same kind of things. Now, I can only draw so fast, right? Uh, but we all know that can, you know, ASICs essentially move at the speed of light, speed of electricity. So we start having this broadcast. We'll just start with just one looping around the network and then another broadcast and another broadcast come in and they just all start looping. And the problem is there's no TTL at layer two. That's a uh, layer three field. So uh, the packets are immortal. They live forever just going around and destroying your network and there's no router to decrement the TTL and stop them. That's the problem with a non-spanning tree network. Uh, so before, I'm going to erase all this, but before I, I forget, let me show you what happened today. Uh, we actually had uh, one of our uh, customers, we, I, I uh, run an IT support company, uh, had one of our customers uh, that moved offices th at his facility. And so he moved his desk to a new, a new place, and he set his IP phone on his desk. Now, IP phones are fantastic in that they actually allow you to plug a Ethernet switch in there, and then they have a built-in switch, right, where you can connect it to uh, your computer. Well, he didn't know that. He's moving his office. He's just thinking, well, this is all fine and dandy. He flips his phone around, and on the back sees two, not one, but two Ethernet jacks. Uh, that, that, those are Ethernet jacks. And so he takes a cable from the wall and plugs it in, 
and takes another cable from the wall and plugs it in. I've never had this happen before. When, when we found it, I was like, seriously, that's awesome, even though it took down the entire network, because I've never seen that done. But it, it actually worked. It totally took down his network because that, I mean, same, same kind of thing. Think of attaching another little uh, non-spanning tree switch right here. You get a broadcast coming in and then going out and then coming in and going out. I mean, you essentially devastate the network no matter what. That's exactly what the phone was doing. Isn't that great? No, it actually causes some of the most stressful times you can experience because everything goes down. I mean, all connectivity is lost, servers are crashing, computers are freezing up. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry spanning tree network. So uh, what we need to do is use spanning tree. And here's the beauty. We can have redundancy as long as spanning tree jumps in. And what does spanning tree do? Block the redundancy. But watch all your other links to make sure that they are all functioning okay. So let's just say uh, this guy, and the way spanning tree works, right, is it picks a root bridge. So how does it do that? Well, it goes in and says who has essentially by default the lowest priority. All these switches have a priority of 32,768. It's, it's sad when you can start pulling those numbers off the top of your head because you've talked about them so often. So so all these switches, you pull them out of the box, they're all 32,768, 32,000, right, right? So they all tie unless uh, an administrator comes in and gets involved and configures priorities differently. So it says, okay, well, let's check our, it's called bridge priority. Well, we're all tied, we're all tied. Okay, what's the next thing that we're going to check? We'll check the MAC address of these switches. So they all compare their MAC address, and whoever has the lowest MAC address between all these switches uh, becomes the root bridge. That's really how it works, but it's a little more efficient than that because uh, these switches actually send one packet called a BPDU, Bridge Protocol Data Unit, which inside of that packet has the priority and the MAC address combined into one packet, and they call that... <laughs> I'm, by the way, teaching spanning tree, which is typically, you know, hours of, of discussion in like two seconds here. Uh, this is called the Bridge ID because this is revisiting uh, some of the stuff that we saw in the SPNGN1 series, also part of the ICND2 series uh, here at CVT Nugget. So if you if you really want a lot of, you know, in-depth expounding on spanning tree, please check out that description there. Here I'm just giving you the fly flyby view. So these BPDUs are sent once every, anyone remember how many seconds? Two. Every two seconds, these guys send a little BPDU saying, hey, here's my bridge ID. This is who I am, identifying myself. And they all elect, you know, it's a one-time election, but essentially they all send the BPDUs uh, not only for the election, but also a keep alive, right, uh, so that they know if another switch ends up dying. So they're all talking. This guy says, okay, well, I have the lowest MAC address, so I will become the root bridge. What does that mean? He is the king of the network. And all the switches say, oh, mighty king, we will light up the best path to get to you. And we'll call that our root port, right? Why is it called a root port? Because that's the port the switch uses to reach the root bridge. Nothing, nothing more. Uh, the, the, the root bridge itself doesn't have root ports because it is the root. Why would it need a port to reach itself? It, it's, it is all, all rootness uh, within itself. So, so what kind of ports does it have? Designated ports. And these, by the way, designated ports are just a port that is forwarding. Matter of fact, if you did a show spanning tree, you would see these guys marked as designated ports as well because it's just a port that is forwarding. And this whole algorithm of spanning tree to try and find the best uh, way to reach the root, uh, and I'll actually talk about that algorithm momentarily, is designed to just find the best way, and then essentially the switches are instructed to block whatever is left over. So they go, okay, well, we've got uh, two ways to reach the root. And the, th the fact is, and um, oh, here's, here's a little key fact. These BPDUs, they are multicast by design. Because a multicast, it's a specially engineered multicast that says, I will go not only uh, to the switch that you know, is directly connected, but I will flow right through that switch and flow right through that switch. And that's how these switches identify loops to begin with. When one says, hey, uh, here's my BPDU, I am switch one, let's just say, that BPDU comes back around and switch one hears himself. And what does he now know? Well, wait a sec, I sent it out this port, it came in there, we have a loop. There's a redundant connection somewhere out there. So this algorithm that I'm describing, you know, with the root port, designated port, all that kind of stuff, is designed to find those redundant links. So essentially all the switches light up their root ports to reach the root bridge and block the redundant link. 
Okay, so essentially this one goes into a blocking state, uh, which means it's disabled until spanning tree notices one of these links go down, then it will unblock that connection. It seems so simple, right? So why did I struggle so much 14 years ago trying to describe spanning tree protocol to a bunch of grumpy Cisco proctors you know, staring at me at that, that CCSI certification? Because our networks don't look like a shape of a, a, a triangle with three switches and it always picks the top one as the root and the bottom link always gets blocked. Our, our, our networks look, well, I would say hopefully look like this, like it's following a design, but I mean, how do, <laughs> I mean, you know as well as I do, how do most, most switch networks look? It's like, well, it connected here and then back here and then we connected that one and that one and then, oh, we ended up with, uh, we wanted some redundancy like that and we did that and Ether channeled it together but then linked this but we had a straight fiber, I mean, it just gets, ugly and then they're like okay uh, so where's the root bridge and how does it find the best way around the network and which links end up getting I mean then you're scratching your head going ah uh, yeah so the right way to design a network is in layers and we've seen Cisco's three-tier model before essentially the access layers are where devices plug into the network essentially that's where our user-facing switches go. And as the network grows, we eventually divide it up into a distribution layer, which is where things like routing happens, access control list happens, quality of service happens. Essentially, that's where the packet spends most of its time and usually gets routed to some destination rather than switched. And then for, for large organizations, they develop a core layer to where you have a core of the network that connects to other uh, distribution layers, like this might be uh, building one right here, and then you have a building two, which follows this same model. Uh, up there and building three, you know, and so the core kind of bridges all those buildings together and essentially gets people where they need to go, right? So that's that's the right design of the network. And if you design it that way, your goal should be to, to elect essentially the most biggest, baddest central switch of your layer two network uh, as the root bridge. So, you know, for instance, if we had this as the root bridge, then we have to answer the question, well, how does how does the switches find which links to buy? I mean, what what's to say that uh, you know this one doesn't get blocked? Well, actually, I'm missing some lines. This should have oh my goodness, all these years, I, I've, th these guys should be connected like this with a little ether channel uh, going on. Uh, but but uh, who's to say that this one gets blocked? It doesn't go this way or that way. And I mean, how do you find that out? This is my MVP slide that I've created for Spanning Tree to really describe how things find the best way. And I, I wish somebody 14 years ago would have come to me and said, Jeremy, this is all there is to it. Let me just show it to you this way. But it, get, it there's just so much documentation on Spanning Tree. It gets lost and all, all of that. So here's, here's how Spanning Tree finds which links get blocked. Screenshot this. Memorize these. Seriously, you'll need to know them. Number one. Elect the root bridge. So let, let's, go, let's go. I'm like, our networks don't look like this. So let me use this as an example, right? This is the typical spanning tree example. Uh, root, right? This guy gets elected as the root. That's always step one. Now, all the other switches find the best path to the root. How do they do it? Number one lowest cost. So they're going to look at their link speed. So let's just say this is switch two and switch three uh, down here, right? They're going to look and say, okay, well, if this is, let's just for grin, say this is a 10 megabit per second link. This is 100. This is 100. This guy, you know, looks and says, hmm, this one costs me 100. Cost of 100 to get across. These guys, 100 megs, cost me 19 and 19. And it figures out how many links it has to cross because of the BPDUs. Those are kind of like little network sonar packets going uh, through the network, right? So it's going to say, okay, well, I could go this way, cost me 100, or I could go this way, this way, and it cost me 38 by the time I add up all of the numbers. I'm going. Uh, I'm going to the right, right? So that's that's going to be the number one way that it finds this becomes the root port, right? But but wait a sec, let's. Let's say it's not that simple. This guy's the root bridge, but we're all gigabit Ethernet links, right? So all these are tied at a cost of four. Now what? Well, it's going to find the lowest bridge ID to break the tie. So, uh, well, actually, this isn't a good diagram because this would be four, 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 and we'd never get to this because it'd say, okay, well, cost of four beats a cost of eight. So let me draw a scenario where we would have this happen, right? Here's a little more complex switch environment. We've got switch four down here. Here's the root bridge. It's all gigabit ethernet. So four, 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 four. Hang on, take that in for a second, right? So it looks, switch four is going, okay, how do I you know, elect the root port? 
because the costs are equal. They're both, it's eight if I go that way, it's eight if I go that way. Well, I'm gonna pick the lowest bridge ID. So I'm gonna say uh, this guy, you know, essentially this of course has the lowest bridge ID whatsoever, the lowest MAC address, right? Uh, so I'm gonna say between uh, switch two and switch three, which of these guys, and he knows, right? Because of the BPDU. He knows switch two and switch three's bridge ID. So he goes, oh, okay, well, you know what? Switch, well, let's, let's just go numerically. Switch two has the lower MAC address. So this will be my root port and, and this one will be blocked, right? Okay, well, what if there's a tie there? You might say, well, okay, Jeremy, what does the topology look like if you have a tie on the bridge ID? Because uh, you would think, what, what if you do something like this? Chunk, chunk. This is the root bridge. This is switch two, right? Now, both of these are gigabit Ethernet, so it's a cost of four. So this is tied. Uh, they're both connecting to the same switch, so this is tied. Now, this one ends up winning. It's going to say, okay, well, I'm going to prefer fast Ethernet 0 slash 1 over fast Ethernet 0 slash 2. This one's forwarding, and then you can see step 3, block whatever's left over, X. So you can go into whatever, hang on, let me go back to the previous slide. Here we go, back here. You can go into however big and hairy of a, of a network, you know, with that craziness I was drawing over here with connections and ah. And you can say, okay, if he is the root bridge, which we all know is elected from the lowest MAC address by default, unless you tune the priority, then you can use the priority. So if he's the root bridge, just go back to the slide, go through the rules and say, okay, well, number one, let's just say I'm on the perspective of him. I'm, all eyes are looking at you, kid. So which way are you going to go? Okay, well, well, this one's easy. You know, lowest cost to the root bridge, let's just imagine they're all gigabit Ethernet, is right there. So bing, that becomes a root port, right? Uh, and then we just keep going through all the different switches and find the best way using those steps that I just showed you. That can solve every spanning tree question where you go, which path will it take? Finally, let's look at the different flavors of spanning tree because spanning tree has been around for a long time. Essentially, since the advent of the switch, there was spanning tree, right? So the original spanning tree, 802.1D, is phenomenal, and it's still the default on a lot of switches. When you pull them out of the box, they'll be running the good old 802.1D original spanning tree protocol. It works. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. The problem is it's slow. Slow, slow, slow. So unless you start getting different tuning and tweaking and proprietary uh, adjustments to the spanning tree, you're looking at you know 30, 60 seconds. That those those kind of speeds. So so uh, let's let me draw up the scenario. You've got the three switches in our typical uh, uh, triangle format. If this link goes down, it can take 30 to 60 seconds. Uh, I would say 30 to 50 most of the time, just because of the way the timers work. Before it actually goes, oh. This is down. Let's go this way and, and finds a backup path, right? Nowadays in, I mean, think about spanning tree back in the 1980s. Is that a problem? <laughs> no, no, not at all. You know, we're concerned with our hairstyles and everything else back then. Nobody, nobody noticed. But nowadays, sub-second convergence is our target, especially in the service provider environment. Because uh, think about it, 30 to 50 seconds. Imagine a service provider failure for 30 to, to 50 seconds. That's every phone call. That's every television program. That's every internet connection uplink. I mean, like down, terminated. Now, your call center just got flooded with hundreds of customer calls saying, hey, am I blah, 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 it's not working. Now, it doesn't matter that it came up a couple minutes later. You already just took the hit. Your support department is now taking time to explain why. All anyway, you know what I mean, right? Slow is bad. So uh, back then, Cisco enhanced uh, the original spanning tree protocol to create something called per VLAN spanning tree protocol. That was the original back when Cisco's ISL encapsulation, that was the proprietary tagging, remember, uh, before, uh, before they developed, well, I'll say it, it was a better version of tagging than you, the original uh, 802.1Q. Uh, tagging, but eventually this this is gone uh, nowadays. We all use PVST plus per VLAN spanning tree is awesome because it allows you to elect different root bridges for different uh, different VLANs. So, for instance, uh, and let me let me show you why. Let's say this is the root bridge, right? Uh, by default, if you're using spanning tree or even rapid spanning tree, oh, hang on, this one right here, rapid spanning tree. 
all VLANs go the same way. So when it says the root bridge is elected, you know, let's say you've got 50 different VLANs, just for grins, that you're configuring on your switch, they all they all say, okay, well, this link is blocked, so all our traffic goes this way. Well, with per VLAN spanning tree protocol, I can say, well, this is the root bridge for maybe VLANs 1 through 25, but this is the root bridge for VLANs 1 through 20, or <laughs> that worked, right, uh, 26 through 50 right in this environment the beauty of that is instead of this link just sitting there idle essentially for vlans 1 through 25 they all go this way and use that root bridge for vlans uh 26 through 50 it'd be great if i drew that in a different color they would all use these links hey, oh hang on wrong <laughs> these links Right, and this would be blocked for VLANs uh, 26 through 50. So it starts utilizing these links that are typically just sitting there idle, waiting for somebody to die. That's the beauty of spanning tree protocol. Um, however, uh, well, I'll come back to that. I'll, I'll explain that uh, at the very end, right down here. Uh, okay, so uh, the industry complained. They said this is too slow. Uh, we have to use proprietary enhancements to get around this 30 to 50 second timer, which locks us into a vendor. So we finally ended up with rapid spanning tree protocol, 802.1W, uh, which uh, came out, I, I want to say 2005 is when that thing reached its final ratification. So close to 10 years ago now. So it's, it's been out for a while and switches have slowly adopted it. But it was a slow adoption because you essentially had to replace a lot of switch hardware out there in order to get the rapid spanning tree protocol feature. So people don't just switch their switches. <laughs> Uh, change out their switches uh, every day. They, they last five, ten years sometimes, so it was a slow go, but now just about everybody uh, at least has the capability of running rapid spanning tree protocol, which improved this convergence time down to two seconds, which uh, still to this day is, is about as low as you can go with, with uh, uh, rapid spanning tree and is, I'll say, a drastic improvement of spanning tree protocol, but still not fast enough for some of us, especially service providers. Again, two seconds. Hang on. Let me, let me just think about it. That was two seconds of silence. I know. I know. It's, it, you're kind of like, okay, big deal, but it obviously shook you up, right? Imagine that happening for every TV program, for every phone call. Again, go through the same thing I did at the beginning. Uh, it's still too much too much. Uh, but, and that's why we'll, we'll talk about some other strategies moving forward. So rapid spanning tree, big improvement. Cisco responded and created proprietary per VLAN rapid spanning tree protocol. So you could do this kind of thing. And then finally, the industry caught up and created multiple spanning tree protocol. What is it? It is essentially Cisco's per VLAN rapid spanning tree protocol for the masses. Multiple spanning tree protocol takes rapid spanning tree protocol and allows you to group together VLANs. Now, it does have that advantage over per VLAN spanning tree protocol is it deals with VLAN groups rather than individual VLANs. See, and this is what I was going to talk about uh, up here for a moment. When you say VLANs 1 through 25 are going to have this as the root, and VLANs 26 through 50 has this as the root, what uh, per VLAN spanning tree and per VLAN rapid spanning tree does is run one instance of spanning tree per VLAN. Think of this like you ever run, um, um, I'm trying to think of something that I do. Uh, multiple, I mean, I guess it's a no-brainer. Multiple web browsers, right? On your computer, when you're going to different sites, I know a lot of times we use tabs now in Firefox and Chrome and even Internet Explorer. We use all these different tabs uh, and all that kind of thing. But we used to have like 50 different web browser instances running on the bottom of our taskbar. What's the problem with that? Well, it eats up resources, right? The more instances of a program that you have running, the more resources are consumed. And it was the same way with Spanning Tree, is essentially, even though all 25 VLANs were going the same direction and had that same root bridge, you actually have one instance of, uh, pr of uh, Spanning Tree per VLAN, which means you've got 50 individual instances if you're using these, which can be brutal on your resources. Multiple Spanning Tree allows you to create groups that you associate. So you say uh, VLANs 1 through 25 are associated with group number 1. Uh, VLANs 26 through 50 are associated with group number 2. And that allows you to run, in this case, two instances of spanning tree for the 50 VLANs. One instance all goes one way, the other instance all goes the other way and has its own root bridge. Most of the time in larger environments like a service provider environment, you're going to see a lot of 
multiple spanning tree, MSTP, uh, just because it gives you the bang for your buck with the industry standard NES, and it's going to give you the uh, efficiency, essentially, of running multiple instances of spanning tree without you know running one per VLAN like Cisco proprietary methods do. So... We have seen, and I, I will be right up front, that was the fastest I've ever taught spanning tree, just because at this point it is revisited. So if it feels like you're drinking from a fire hose, I really do encourage you to go visit some of those other series like ICND2, uh, where I go through it in multiple nuggets and spread out that description, or SPNGN1. Just revisit some of those spanning tree topics in a not so fast fashion. Um, but this did a review of the core of spanning tree, finding the best path through the spanning tree network, and then saw the multiple flavors of spanning tree. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.